The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiasrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now... The Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, 
You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizarites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, and the second bull seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jeroboam, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. Now, all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet. And the Abazrites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, Behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please, let me test just once more with the fleece. Please, let it be dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. I, um, I love the reading of God's Word, uh, just to sit back and... Um, either read it or have it read to you. Uh, it's uh, in power, powerful, powerful, powerful words because they have the ability to change us. Um, and so I believe in them and, and so should you. We are in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6 is where we will be this morning and we're talking about courage. 
All right, courage. What is courage? Where do we find courage? How can we be more courageous? Uh, what does it look like uh, to be a person of courage? And we're going to be looking at the life of Gideon, all right, or Gideon. I understand there's different pronunciations to this name, uh, but I prefer Gideon. So we're going to look at the life of Gideon, but before we do that, I'm going to pray, all right? We have a lot to get through in a short amount of time, and so let me pray. I'll pray for you, you pray for me. Uh, that God would do that which only he can do. Um, And so, Father, I I ask that my words would submit to yours. I ask that my heart would submit to yours, uh, that you would do a work in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the chapter begins with the Israelites at it again. All right, at it again. They've experienced a season of peace, uh, but now they've taken their eyes off God and things are going horribly bad again, right? Verse one, it says, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years. Now, if you were here last week, you'd remember that that I I made the point that the the Midianites had a a relatively close relationship to the Israelites, a somewhat friendly one. And and yet here we see that that, that the Midianites are the ones oppressing the Israelites. So I did say last week, look, they have a a friendly relationship, but it wasn't a perfect one, right? It wasn't a perfect one, but but here we are. uh, The Lord has handed the Israelites over to the Midianites, right? Uh, And they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and the people from Pretoria East came and attacked them. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. But if you've, there's some places in Pretoria East that you're like, it's possible. And I know some of you guys are thinking, is he talking about mums? No, mums is great. (laughs) All right? Talking about silver legs. But anyway, let's carry on. And they encamped against them and destroyed the produce of the land, even as far as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. They and their camels were without number, and they entered the land to lay waste to it. So the Israel became poverty-stricken because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. See, what's different here than the other places that we have been is that the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the the people from the east, they, they didn't come to occupy the land, they came to plunder it. They came to plunder it, leaving them poverty-stricken. And so the Israelites cry out to the Lord. Verse 7, when the Israelites cried out to him because of Midian, the Lord sent a a prophet. They're crying out to God, and they're going, God, would you save us? Would you send us a deliverer? Would you come and rescue us? And then God sends them a sermon. So don't knock the sermon, guys. Don't knock the sermon. The Lord sent a prophet to them. He said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt and out of the place of slavery. I rescued you from the power of Egypt and the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you live in. God sends them a sermon to remind them of what he has done. And in reminding them of what he has done, he's reminding them of who he is. If you were here at part one, you would remember me saying that forgetfulness leads to unfaithfulness. This is why we regularly do this. We, we, we don't do it because it's like, well, we have nothing else to do on a Sunday morning. No, we gather to be reminded of God's faithfulness because we navigate through the week, through times of challenge and, and, and uncertainty and we just, we don't know what's going on and so, so we need to be reminded lest we take matters into our own hands. He sends them a prophet who brings a sermon to remind them of what God has done and who 
he is. And the prophet says, but you did not obey me. He's saying, God is saying to you guys, you did not obey me. Friends, the biggest problem that the Israelites had was not the Midianites. Their biggest problem was their own wickedness. Their biggest problem was their own hearts. It was their disobedience, not the Midianites. And so God sends a teaching to reveal this to them. But then how does the sermon end? How does the prophet's sermon end? With God interrupting. God interrupts the sermon with deliverance. Look with me, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came. Now, if you've been tracking with us, you would know that when we see the angel of the Lord here in Judges, that is a theophany, that is God himself. The angel of the Lord came and he sat under the oak that was in Oprah, which belonged to Joaz, the Abizrite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. This is a, a really strange place to thresh wheat. See, the threshing of wheat, um, by no means a farmer, but, but you would take the, the wheat, after gathering it, you'd put it in a, a bowl, and, and then you'd stand where there is a breeze, so that as you kind of throw up the wheat, the breeze would catch what they call the chaff, and then the chaff would remove, like the wind would remove the chaff, the stuff that you don't want. And uh, yet he's doing this in a wine press. W wine presses were, were, were dug in the ground. There's no breeze coming through there. He's doing this because he's afraid. He's afraid of the Midianites. He, he's, he's doing the right thing in the wrong location. He, he's doing the right assignment in the wrong location. Friends, I want to tell you that there's so many of us who are doing the right thing in the wrong location. And, and oftentimes, oftentimes, it's because of fear that we're afraid. We're afraid of the, the, the challenge in that particular location. We're afraid of the uncertainty in that particular location. You're doing the right thing, friends, but you're doing it in the wrong location. Sometimes it's because of fear of people. We fear people more than we fear God. Let me extend this a, a, a little bit. There are, there are so many people, so many people who, who know that, that God has called you to do something, but he's called you to do it in a particular place. But you don't want to go do that in that place because you're fearful that, now I have to have this difficult conversation with people in this current place to say, I believe that God has called me to go somewhere else. It's fear of people. See, what happens over time is, is you become disgruntled, and angry, and frustrated, and then you open up the door for the spirit of division to come in. Because you're doing the right thing, God's called you to do this, but because you're doing it at the wrong place, you're frustrated with everyone else. And so now you're trying to call, them, hey guys, we should be doing, we should, and they're going, whoa, wait, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And so maybe that's a message for you today. You need to ask, ask God, God, you've called me to do this, but am I doing it in the right place? Now you might ask, oh, no, how, how do I figure that out? Well, let me go ahead and tell you. It's the same thing I say every week. We figure these things out in the context of community. Yeah. Be very careful to make yeah. decisions in isolation. We figure this stuff out in the context of community. We, we, we come around like-minded people, brothers and sisters, people who love us, and you go, listen, I know that God's called me to do this, and, and, and you would affirm this because of the, the gifts that he has placed in me, right? So he's called me to do this, but I just feel like God, God's calling me to a different location. And if you have men and women who love you, they're gonna figure that out with you together. But, but if you surround yourself with fans, they're gonna go, let's figure out, I wanna... Okay, do they want me to affirm or do they want me to agree to the... Okay, they're just going to tell you whatever it is that you want. This is why we go to fans when we want to make big decisions. We don't go to people who are going to press in, who are going to ask those difficult questions. Why is it that you want to go? 
What are you pursuing over there? Press into community. Don't find yourself like Gideon, doing the right thing in the wrong location. Verse 12, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. I'm pretty sure at this moment Gideon's going, who else is here with me? Who, who is he talking to? Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. Don't we do this all the time? We, we look at our circumstances and we're like, so God, where, where are you? God, God, why are you late? God, did you not do X, Y, and Z with that generation? And then you promised that you would do it with, like, where are you? The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. He says to him, go. Great questions, go. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. I'm pretty sure God's going, fantastic. You are exactly who I need. You remember the story of Ehud? God uses the, the unassuming. It's the unexpected. It's those who recognize their weakness, but step into the presence of God. But I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. That's powerful. You will strike down Midian as if it were one man. Then he said to him, if I have found favor with you, give me a sign that you are speaking with me. I mean, how much more do you need? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. How, how much more do you need? Please do not leave this place until I return to you. Let me bring my gift and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. How patient is God? So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from half a bushel of flour. So he, he goes and prepares this meal, brings it to God, God touches it, and the, the thing just goes up in flames, right? So Gideon brings a meal, God receives it as an offering. Verse 22, when Gideon realized that he was the, the angel of the Lord, he said, oh no, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace to you, don't be afraid, for you will not die. Well, why, why would God say this to him? Well, it's, it's probably because Gideon is remembering the words of Moses, found in Exodus 33 verse 20, where God says to Moses, listen, you cannot see me face to face, because if you do, you will die. And so Gideon realizes that I, I have just come face to face with God, like it's going to end for me. And yet God says, no, peace to you. Don't be afraid, for you will not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. After recognizing who this is, after an encounter with the Lord, he goes, you know what? I'm going to build an altar. The Lord is peace. F friends, if you want peace, where do you go? You go to the Lord. So, so many of us, we go, you know, I want peace in my life, so maybe I should go to my bank account. Maybe I should go to my job. Maybe I should go to a relationship. Maybe I should go to sex. No, 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 no. You want peace? You go to the Lord. He's the only one that can give us the peace that we need. And this word peace, shalom. This idea of universal flourishing. Friends, we've been made to flourish. 
We've been made. We've been beautifully designed to flourish. And that will only happen when we are in the presence of the Lord. There is no other way. I, I don't care what anyone else tells you. I don't care what book you read. I don't care what podcast you heard. The only way that you will find shalom is to be with the Lord. Gideon recognizes this. And he builds an altar. And he says, I'm going to call this, the Lord is peace. Now, all of this is happening to Gideon while he's, he's threshing wheat in a hiding place. God calls him. And he says, no, you go, you go, you go and deliver Israel. This brings us to our first point. And that is, Gideon is not called because he's courageous. He is courageous because he is called. Let, let, me, let me say that to you again. Gideon is not called because he is courageous. He's not. He's hiding. He is courageous because he is called. In verse 12, God calls him a, a, a valiant warrior. See, here's what God is doing. He, he's, he's, dis, he's not describing Gideon as he is, but rather as he will become. If, if you're trying to distinguish between the voice of God in your life and the voice of Satan, God will always describe you as you are becoming. Holy, redeemed, restored. The voice of Satan will always describe you of how you used to be. You're an enemy of God. You're worthless, broken. That, 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 that's the difference. And so in this moment here, God is saying, no, 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 get in. This is, I'm calling you by what you are going to become. God doesn't call the brave. He makes the called brave. And if you are a child of God, if you've crossed the line of faith, you have been called. And you have been clothed with all of God's goodness and all that he promises you. God then commissions Gideon. He tells him to go. He says, I am sending you in verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. God is sending you today. He is sending you to your neighborhood. He is sending you to your place of work. He is sending you to your family. He's sending you to your friends. Go, he says. This is why we often talk about the great commission here. And we should treat it as a commandment. It's not a suggestion. So many of us, we think of it as a suggestion. And I say this over and over and over again because we need to hear it. But, but I, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if I have the right words. I, I, just, I don't know if I have the right intellect. I don't know if I know all of, all of the scriptures. God goes, then you're the perfect person. It's the arrogant that God goes, I, I can't use. It's those who think they have it all together. God goes, I can't, I can't use. But those who come with open hands and go, okay, I, I, I don't know what's in front of me. I don't know how it's going to kind of play itself out. I, I, I just don't know. But you know what? God, you said you are with me. Yeah. And that is all that I need. Amen. And so he sends Gideon. But notice, you heard it read to you. Before Gideon goes and fights the Midianites. And we'll get to that, right? The, the whole story of the 300, it's epic. We love it. But, but before we get there, God sends Gideon home. He sends him home. Verse 25, it says, On that very night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull and a second bull, seven years old, then tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father and cut down the ash pole beside it. He, he sends him home. And he says, okay, now, now you've had this encounter with me. Now I need you to go home, 
demolish that altar and establish something for me. So, so many of us, we want revival in our nation. We want revival in our city. Revival starts here. What are you going to do here? In your home? Where idolatry lives? Don't be fooled and think, no, 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 it just it, it, it exists out there. It lives in here as well. See, Gideon had built an altar to the Lord, but his father had an altar to Baal. Gideon's new commitment to God had set him at odds with his own family and community. I hear stories of this often. Folks coming to faith and then going, okay, but now I, I need to have an uncomfortable conversation with my family, with my friends, with my community. That the things I used to do, I can no longer do. Because my heart now belongs to another. In this moment, Gideon was having to choose between one father and another. And this wasn't an easy thing. By no means, especially in this time, this was no simple thing. To go against a father was to risk everything. To risk inheritance. Shame that would come his way. Sometimes even death. But, but here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. Is that when we turn to our father, when we put our trust in him, we receive an inheritance. One that far outweighs anything that you will receive in this world. Yeah. It, it, it is unfading. It will not perish. Yeah. It is secured for you, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what can you take from me should be our response. The, the, the shame that would come his way, well, God clothes him with honor. Yes. You are my child. Oh, that's so good. My child. Sure, I might die, but because I put my trust in God, I'm going to live. It's a massive difference. Some of us, we think, no, but we're living the good life here. The so-called good life. It leads to death. That, that life, it leads to death. But when we put our trust in Jesus... When, when we lay it all down to him, we, we die to self, but we receive abundant life. That's the promise. And so getting here, the choice between a, a father and a, and a father. Verse 27, so Gideon took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his father's family, and the men of the city to do it in the daytime, he did it at night time. Now look, I'm glad that he did it, right? But, but, but he, he did it at night time. Again, this is, this, this is us. Let's not be too quick to judge Gideon. This is, this is us. So many of us have a nighttime faith. When what we need is a, not just a daytime faith, but an all the time faith. But, but, but here it's a, it's a nighttime faith. I, I let, let me be real. When I came to faith, when I crossed the line of faith, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I had a nighttime faith. My friends didn't really know that I was a Christian. Because I wasn't quite ready. I was like, I don't, I don't know if I can have these kinds of conversations. I don't know if I can tell them. I'd, I'd, but... but I had to step into the presence of the Lord. I had to trust him. And I had to say, God, it's not, it's not about them. It's about glorifying you. So many of us need a, a daytime, a all-the-time faith. So, some of you guys, you, like your friends don't even know that you're a Christian. You've been walking with Jesus for years, and then like they find out, they're like, you're, you're a what? You know it's bad when someone says, you're a Christian, Christian? Like when they have to say it twice, you know it's bad. On both sides, it's like, you're a Christian, Christian? You, bro, I've seen your Instagram, come on, right? Or, or it's, you're a Christian? Oh, Christian, like you, one of those, oh, okay. Like it's, it's not a good thing. 
We need to be bold about our faith. But the only way that's going to happen is if we trust in the one who gives us the faith. A daytime faith. A, 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 a come and see faith. John chapter 4 verse 29. The woman at the well. She has an encounter with Jesus and she goes, you know what, I'm going back home and I'm going to go tell. You, know, you guys need to come and see. Yeah. Like how crazy would that have been? It's like, you know, but we know, but we know you. We, we know you. We know, know you. But now you're coming and you're talking about a savior. You're talking about a relationship with the father. You're, 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 she's going, come and see. I don't care what you think about me. I need you to come and see a daytime faith. And it's, it's the, the woman, at the, it's, such a, it's such a beautiful story. Let me, per, permit me to offer him for just a moment. John chapter 4, verse 29, come and see. This is the woman at the well. We can actually look at the life of Jesus and then, and then jump all the way to Acts chapter 1-8 where, where Jesus says to his disciples, the, the Spirit is coming and, and when the Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world, right? Now, now what I love about Jesus is like he, he's not like a, that, that CEO that sits in the corner office and just tells people to do stuff but he's never done it before. Right? Like, I need you guys to go into the mine uh, deeper, d drill deeper. It's like, have you ever been in the mine? No, 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 no. No, no, I study. Right? That's, that's not Jesus. Jesus will never send us to places that he himself has never gone. John chapter 2, J Jesus rolls into the temple and cleanses it. Where is the temple? Jerusalem. John chapter 3, Jesus has an encounter with a, a man called Nicodemus, a religious man. Immediately after that, he goes and visits his friend Lazarus. Where, where does Lazarus live? Judea. It's Bethany, Judea. And then the scriptures tell us that, that he has massive influence in that area. After that, he goes to Samaria, where he has an encounter with a Samaritan woman. The gospel spreads. And it's at that place, at the end of John chapter 4, that the Samaritans recognize who Jesus is and they go, this is the Savior of the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the world. Right there between John chapter 4 and John, John chapter 2 and John chapter 4. God will never, he will never, like Jesus will never do this. He'll never say, I want you to do this and he himself has never done it. The... the Nope, we're running out of time. That was a real good one. The people wake up in the morning. They see that their altar has been torn down. Verse 29, they said to each other, who did this? After they made a thorough investigation. I have no idea what this means. Is this like CSI? Is it like, was there fingerprints where they're like, we know, we know. And then they like, ask a few people and then they stand and they go, we're ready to give a profile. <laughs> Middle-aged Hebrew man. No, no, no. They made a thorough investigation. They said, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he tore down Baal's altar and cut down the Asher pole beside it. I'm pretty sure Gideon at this point was thinking to himself, this was not a good idea. But Joash said to all who stood against him, because Joash is now in a really weird situation, right? What do I do now? As a father, what do I do now? He says, would you plead Baal's case for him? Would you save him? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead his own case because someone tore down his altar. He basically says, hey, hold on. If this idol is as powerful as we have been saying, then let him defend himself. Let this false god defend himself. I know we, we read this and we think this is hilarious. 
right? Like they had a little uh, idol and uh, like this whole thing built and it's like, yeah, that's ridiculous. We don't do that. That's not us, right? Never. It's because we think that idolatry is, is only when we worship something else other than God. Friends, idolatry is also when we worship something in addition to Jesus. That, that's the idolatry that many of us step into. It's a Jesus plus. No, 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 I believe Jesus. I believe 100%. I'm a Christian. Why do you think I'm here this morning? But for me, it's Jesus plus money. Because I need that security. I, I just, I, because I don't, think, I don't think God will provide for me. So I need to help him out. It's Jesus plus career. That's why, that's why like, I pour everything into my career. I will cut myself for my career. No, but I still love Jesus as well. It's just I need to help Jesus out a little bit. You know, Jesus doesn't read the contracts properly, so I just need to, I need to help him out a little bit. Jesus plus relationships. There's a reason why you, you won't stop sleeping with the person that's not your wife or your husband. It's a deep fear. Deep fear. Even though you know it's wrong, you're just like, I, ca- I, can't, I can't let go because I don't know if, if God can provide for me everything that I need emotionally. And so you give yourself up to a false God. We are the Jesus plus camp. And some of us, some of us need to demolish some altars. Some of us need some daytime faith to demolish some altars. Because if the Lord is going to be your peace, you cannot have the Lord is peace and let me build something around it. God will not stand for that. Faced with having to choose between this false god and his son, Gideon's dad chooses to save his son and let this false god take his own chances. And it works. How crazy is that? It works. Which makes me wonder, what kind of influence did Gideon's dad have? I'm that guy, like, when I read the Bible, that's how I read it, guys. I'm, I, like, I, I want to ferociously come to the scriptures and go, okay, but now, but now, wait, how, let me turn here, maybe there's a, no, nothing. Like, what, what happened? You went from, we're going to kill this little boy to, like, you know what, let's change this guy's name and call him a ball champion because he destroys false gods. Like, what, what happened? Well, I believe that Joash was like a, a priest-like figure to this false god, that he was in charge of the altar. And so that means that, that when the people listen to him and they go, okay, hold on, this guy is saying that this is not real. We should listen. Why am I telling you this? Because, friends, you have influence. You have influence. Many of you are like Joash. You, you, you think like, no, no, this faith is just me and I, just, I do things on my own. It doesn't matter what other people think. It's not what, it doesn't matter what they see on my social media. No, friends, you have influence. There are people who are watching your lives and, and are going, man, if, if he believes that Jesus is Lord and Savior, if, if, if he's going, no, my, my, my career is not my identity, my relationships are not my identity, then maybe, maybe we should consider. Because I pray that you have that influence. In your workplace, in your neighborhood, among your friends, I pray. I pray that you would recognize the calling, the calling in your life. This independent, like, no, I live my own life, I do my own thing, that, that, is, that is not of the kingdom of God. God has beautifully designed us for fellowship. He just has. So be mindful of what you do. Be mindful of what you say. Because one day you will stand face to face with God. 
And he'll ask you about what you said and what you posted and how you responded and what you thought. And he'll say, but did you see all those people that you led astray? You've entered the kingdom of God. Verse 33. All the Midianites, Amalekites, and the people from the east (laughs) gathered together, crossed over the Jordan, and camped in in the Jezreel Valley. This is the same spot that Barak fought Sisera and his army last week. The Spirit of the Lord enveloped, is that how you say it? Clothed Gideon. There we go. (laughs) And he blew the ram's horn rallied the people. He sent the messengers all throughout Manasseh. He sent messengers also to Asher. Remember Asher from last week? They were the ones chilling by the harbor. They didn't go to battle, but now here they show up. I'm glad they listened to the sermon. Don't knock the sermon. Called a whole bunch of people and they came to meet him. And then they go to war. We'll catch up on that in the next part. But, but it's this next section that we get to, verse 36 to verse 40, what is famously known as the wall fleece test, right? Many of us know this. It's like, okay, God, like if you're really with us, then, then, then make the wool uh, wet and the grass dry. And then he does it. And he's like, okay, 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 let's change things up again. Maybe do, maybe, like, I love the fact that he says in verse 39, don't be angry with me. Now, <laughs> I've been married long enough to know that if I start a conversation that way, like, you just know, right? Like, I know I've done something. Like, hey, I just don't, listen, don't be angry with me. Okay, and then you say it, and you're like, but how? How can I not be angry? How? How? But God isn't. God isn't. The famous wool fleece test. Now, this portion of scripture has been misused, abused, and confused in so many ways. Right? Now, I don't have time to unpack like, where, places have, where people have taken this and, 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 and all of it, but, but let me try to make it plain for you as I land the plane. That this isn't about h- how to make decisions. That's, that's not the application here. It's not like, okay, um, God, I have two jobs. Um, could you do what you did for Gideon, and then you go outside in the morning and you lay out, like, so if you do this, like, that's not what it's about. It's not about making decisions. Why? Because Gideon already knew what God wanted him to do. That part was clear. So it's not about that. Leaving us with the question, then, then what is going on here? Friends, this is about Gideon's fear and his deep desire for assurance. That's what's going on here. It's about his fear and this deep desire for assurance. The struggle is real. The places that God calls us, they they, they are challenging, they are uncertain, it's, it's hard, it's real. And so we often find ourselves looking to the heavens and going, God, are you really with me? I need assurance. And what's beautiful is that our loving Father doesn't condemn Gideon. That means he doesn't condemn us. God is not afraid of your doubts. So many of us, we we doubt and then then we we run to all these places hoping that they they will fill that, that they will give us comfort, that they'll assure us. No, God God is not worried about your doubt. Bring your doubt to him. He's more concerned when you take your doubt somewhere else. Bring your doubt to him. He will assure you. He assured Gideon and he will assure us. And so what is our wool fleece, the cross, the cross. We only have to look to the cross. God, are you with us? The cross. God, will you provide for us? The cross. God, will you protect us? The cross. God, will you heal us? The cross. Will you restore and reconcile? The cross. He sent his one and only son as assurance for us. To say, that which I promised years ago, here it is now. He will live the life that you and I were meant to live. He will die the death, the the horrific 
horrendous death that you and I deserve. And then he will walk out of that tomb. He will walk out of that tomb clothed in victory. And then he will look to his people and he will say, come, let's go. I am with you. We are the activity of God in this world. God, will you send, will you, will you, the economy, the, it's unstable, I don't know, that like racism, prejudice, it's tough, poverty, like we'll, we'll broken, we'll, will you send, and God says, I'm sending you, rooted fellowship, you, 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 clothed in Christ's victory. And whenever you need assurance, look to the cross. Our courage comes from our salvation. Empowered by the Spirit. Will it be uncomfortable? Is there uncertainty ahead? Will it be challenging? Yes. The answer is yes, every single time. But God is our protector. And so therefore, He's our peace. God is our protector and therefore, He is our peace. And so I'm going to call the band up to come and close in song. And, And as they come up, I want to read to you a psalm. Psalm 57. Hear these words of our Father. As, as I believe, they, 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 they come in the spirit of what we've just walked through in the life of Gideon. God doesn't call the brave. He makes the called brave. That if you want revival, revival begins at home. God won't call you somewhere to a place to go do something if you're not willing to do it here. And if we ever need assurance of if you will he be with us, we look to the cross. Psalm 57 says this. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I call to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. God sends his faithful love and truth. I am surrounded by lions. Whether it's in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your community, with your friends, with your family, I I, I know it feels like I'm surrounded by lions. I lie down among the devouring lions. People whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. God be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. They prepared a net for my steps. I was despondent. They dug a pit ahead of me, but they fell into it. My heart is confident, God. My heart is confident. I will sing. I will sing praises. Wake up, my soul. Some of you need to cry out to your soul and say, wake up. Our God is victorious. Our God reigns. Our God is seated on his throne, fully in control. Our God is for us. Wake up, harp, and lyre. I will wake up the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. And so, Father God, we we ask that you would wake up our souls, that we would recognize that you are God, that you are our Father, that we are loved more than we could ever imagine, that there is no sin that is beyond your forgiveness. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would convict hearts, that so many of us have walked away from you, believing that we are the masters of our own destiny, that we've been lured by the the lies of the evil one. Holy Spirit, 
Meet us here this morning. Be strong and courageous. And for some of us, that just simply means to be strong enough to say, I am not in control and I need you, Jesus. Before it's about leaving these these doors and and going out into the world and and sharing our faith and making disciples, it's, it's about just being honest with ourselves and saying, I'm in desperate need of a Savior. I've tried to do this on my own. And it just doesn't work. I just want to be honest. It just doesn't work. I need you. Make us strong. Make us courageous, Lord. Wake up our souls. And let us sing to the King of kings, the King of glory. In Jesus' name we pray.